Welcome to the Farrell's Fit Podcast, where we help you to explore your capacity to move better, push further, and achieve your limitless potential through fitness, nutrition, recovery, and lifestyle. Hey guys, welcome back to the Farrell's Fit Podcast. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm here with Brandon today. Hey Brandon, how you doing? We're doing great today. Good. Doing much better than before. Everybody's being a little bit greater day by day. I can see this light at the end of the tunnel. Gyms are going to open back up soon. People are going to start smiling again, being happy again. They can only God. see my face right now. All <laughs> smiles, man. We're all smiles. Okay, today um, I want to kind of take you on a little little history lesson, a little a little uh, a little fitness journey. Um, this this uh, stuff I find kind of fascinating, and I when I started going down the rabbit hole on it, I got deeper and deeper into it, and I realized there's a lot of stuff. I didn't really think about, so I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that you guys didn't necessarily think about um, in terms of like where we are in terms of uh, the fitness industry today and how we got here and what the evolution of that journey was and where certain facets of the industry come from and why they exist, why why we do certain things um, and why things have changed so much in, in the last kind of like, well why the things have always changed so much as, as time has gone by. Obviously, fitness these days is, is a lot different than what it was 30 years ago. Um, it's interesting right now because fitness, I mean, especially in, in the in the vacuum that we're in, like fitness is just such a huge part of people's lives. Um, going to the gym is such a, you know, such a norm now. Um, and this norm did not exist, you know, 40 years ago. Like there was no, there was no such thing as a, a gym and membership or... Um, it being such, I mean, in terms of the general population, there was no such thing as like everybody going to the gym and gyms being a huge part of, of, of everybody's lives. Um, that said, it's interesting that, of course, more more people have gym memberships than ever before in the history of mankind, and yet we are in worse shape than we've ever been as a as a planet, <laughs> which is kind of fascinating, um, and obviously. The reason for that is because although, you know, relatively a lot more people go to the gym, uh, the the population is a lot bigger than it, it was before, and there are a lot of people who don't go to the gym, and there are a lot of people who don't do anything physical. Um, and, you know, just as a, as a, as a, as a race, as, as, a, as a being, we used to obviously do a lot more physical activity than we do these days. We do, we live more sedentary lifestyles, we have more more technology and more robots to do things for us um, and it's getting worse and worse and worse and people move less and less and less Um, and although they may be active for an hour or an hour and a half a day doing something the rest of the day is spent kind of sedentary sedentary and um, this wasn't always the case so I want to go back kind of to the the beginning Um, I want to kind of explore you know the, the the evolution of of fitness and of physicality and you know, how we really got to this place that we're in now. So if we go, you excited, Brandon? Oh, I'm pumped. I got, I got a few history <laughs> ones to throw in there myself. Yeah, so. Brandon's a history major, so he's going to uh, throw in some intellect at some point. Um, if we go right back to the beginning, obviously, as we start to evolve as human beings, of course, we are running every day. We are jumping on things. We are climbing. We are crawling. We are trying to go on the hunt. We are running f- we are running to catch animals and then we are running away from animals so that we don't get killed. We are climbing up trees to, to either gather or to hide. Um, we are spending all day on our feet. Uh, we are just very physical beings from, from dawn till dusk, essentially. So it's not too hard to imagine why we're kind of in better physical shape um, than, than we are now. Even more aware of like, our calorie exertion. We're more like, hey, right. we haven't eaten, we haven't done this, we haven't done that. It's almost nightfall, we don't have a shelter, we have to get this thing and that thing. So a little and, bit more aware too then. And there's no convenience, right? There's no convenience. It's not like, I'm, I'm hungry, I'm gonna pop to the shop for a, a bar. <laughs> that does not exist. Can so, you call the task rabbit to put together the bed right, for us so we have some place right. to sleep tonight? There is only survival. And survival is eating, it's killing, it's eating, it's sleeping, and it's not getting eaten by <laughs> all the animals that are chasing you. So mm. again, it's not too hard to imagine why um, why we, we were different uh, physical beings then and how we were you know, fitter essentially than we, than we are now. Of course, our life expectancy was less because at some point we probably would get eaten. But um, yeah, in general, of course, 
there weren't too many obese people walking around in, uh, at, the, at the dawn of time. <laughs> um, then from there, obviously, we, we arrive eventually at the agricultural revolution. Um, and obviously, the physical demands of harvesting and farming and that kind of thing, obviously, again, keep us in good physical shape. Uh, that shit is hard. Uh, dawn till dusk, again, you know, you're essentially on your feet, uh, moving around all day, uh, trying to gather to, 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 to feed your family uh, and to, uh, you know, not let the crops die out and to, to keep things going. So uh, there, is no, there is no sedentary behavior. That's not an option. You can't, mm. can't behave that way. So again, you are forced, your lifestyle forces you into activity. That one's unique because like the first heavy introductions of carbohydrates too with right. grain, um, just a lot more vegetation, vegetables to grow because it would last longer too in storage. And, you know, you have to worry about thousands or tens of thousands of people you're living with now rather than your tribe. Right. So it's just, uh, and then you have alcohol being introduced then. So right. just new things and new pleasures of, you know, civilization. Right. Coming right. along with it. Yeah. And then, of course, um, after that, we kind of get into, um, oh, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention this. There's, there's a great, there was a great article on this. Um, I think the website's called The Art of Manliness, which is great. But um, <laughs> it, was, it was a great article. It's kind of the one that, that, that sent me down the rabbit hole. So I, want to, uh, I wanted to give them a shout out. Um, so after the, after the kind of agricultural uh, revolution, the next kind of period of time that's interesting is uh, what we call the ancient times, 4000 BC to 476 AD, um, where you know war and battle become such a uh, an important point important part of civilization and that necessitates being physically prepared for battle so it's not just you know trying to gather food anymore it's you know how am i going to survive battle how am i going to you know perform well in battle uh, and physicality and being physical able in battle um becomes an important thing so you know, in, there is imposed physical training on, on young men at that time um, in order to prepare them for battle. Uh, obviously, this includes uh, running, throwing, uh, crawling, climbing, lifting and carrying heavy objects and things, uh, wrestling. Uh, all, um, again, all you would say, you know, very, very functional things for the, the tasks that you have to do. So not a million miles away from what we'd already been doing in in uh, you know as we had evolved um it's just now that the the purpose of that training is different it's no longer just to hunt and to, to gather food it's to survive the the horrors of, of war mm -hmm. um you know this is uh, roman times greek times you know yeah um, you're thinking spartans one yeah of all the spartans that infamous kind of stuff. ones and yeah. there's some great primary source stuff about like them doing calisthenics with each other like yes before exactly. battle or war it's like oh well, then, of course, you also had the Olympic Games coming around in, there in ancient Greece, Greece at that point. So we're starting to use um, practical movements um, that, were, that were developed for the preparedness of war, but now putting it into a different arena. Right now, it's for the purpose of games. So we start to see this introduction of, you know, sport for fun. Or the entertainment industry. Entertainment. <laughs> the entertainment industry, yeah. Um, so lots of outdoors, uh, outdoor training for sport. Um, and also, interestingly, the Greeks and the Romans start to celebrate the physicality of the human body as it looks, like the beauty of the human body mm -hmm. and the aesthetics of the human body. I mean, of course, we all know the Greek statues, yeah. Roman statues. Um, it really was a celebration of uh, sound mind, sound body and sound soul. Um, so, you know, we start to really appreciate, you know, the the what the human body looks like. And this kind of exists uh, up into the Dark Ages. Um, uh, the 5th to the 15th century, it kind of gets reversed. So you almost see a rejection of the aesthetic. Um, it starts to be, you know, it's a chaotic time. It's a barbaric time. There's lots of plagues. And it's also the kind of um, the overwhelming... Uh, introduction of christianity and the spreading of christianity which is more about the soul than it is about the body so the body starts getting rejected in favor of spirituality and, and the soul because the body is no longer important it's really about the afterlife uh, the body is, is full of sin and it's unimportant 
where it's really so... pl- it plagues us here in this country the puritanical <laughs> stuff man it's, it's so embedded in there yeah yeah so a man's soul is its true essence so his body didn't matter so much and it's interesting because when you think about when you think about like the history books you read as a kid or the movies you watched as a kid and you think about the greeks and the romans it's always kind of like this statuesque kind of muscular warriors mm-hmm. and then when you get into the dark ages it's kind of like beer drinking like banquets and like <laughs> fat people <laughs> like yeah you remember all those movies and those books it was just like an indulgent an indulgence of the body because it didn't matter and so you think people, of the medieval or yeah uh, exactly. middle ages time yeah yeah so people start to really like um abuse their bodies because in essence their body didn't matter because it was only the soul that mattered it was only the spirit that mattered so you you created this this horrible kind of like um, destruction of the human body um, also you know in, in terms of society it was a feudalistic society so you know you only really had nobles and mercenaries that were, were training for, for, for battle that would go through physical training um, and military service uh, the rest of the population were basically peasants who were just serving the lords of the land um, and they would get their, their physical exertion through through farming and labor mm-hmm. so um, there's not so much this 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 beautiful physicality that you had before with the with the romans and the greeks as a uh, now it's more just like either you're in this class and you're doing this kind of stuff or you're in this class and you're doing that kind of stuff mm-hmm. but again um you see you know certainly more physicality than you than you do today uh, simply because people were forced to do it yeah and people look skinnier because there's a lot less resources as well right. yeah. if you don't you have malnourished essentially yeah <laughs> Um, after this, we get to um, the Renaissance period, where you see a bit, a bit of a, a revival of the, the aesthetic um, that we talked about before. Um, this is in the 1400s to the 1600s. Um, there is a much greater interest in the body, in anatomy, in biology, in health, and in physical education. First book on physical exercise is published in 1553, and then. 1569 a book is released called De Art Gymnastica um, and it was based on uh, harking back to the, the Greeks and the Romans but it was based on studying the Greek and the Roman approach to um, hygiene diet and exercise so again often with evolution it's all cyclical so we've gone from the, the, the appreciation of the aesthetic to the rejection of the aesthetic and the focus on the spiritual and then that you see the revival in the Renaissance period of starting to appreciate the, the human the human body again and starting to want to take care of our bodies and not just abuse them. Um, and this book in in, in uh, 1569, the, uh, the Art Gymnastica, is basically considered to be the first book on uh, s- uh, sports medicine, and it strongly influenced uh, the wave of physical education um, that still exists two centuries later. So. Um, it was a, it was a fairly important book in in, in 1560, 1569. Who came up with them? Where was it? Uh, um, where is it from? Uh, gymnastic. Uh, it's from Germany. Um, I forget the name of the author. Girolamo Mercurali. Mercurali. Pretty important book. Um, and then, of course, uh, another big shift that happens is the Industrial Revolution. Um, so in the Industrial Revolution, of course, this is when we start to see, you know, sedentary behavior creep in. And the reason sedentary behavior creeps in is because we start to use machines to do the work for us. So in all these different industries, uh, we no longer have to do all the physical labor ourselves. We're using, uh, you know, advanced tools and machinery to, to do that work for us. And this is, you know, around 1760. And it, it basically changes the way that human beings move. Um, this kind of sees the shift towards intentional physical exercise uh, again so before as it was like we had to do this stuff in order to survive now it was because our lives are more sedentary we have to seek out physicality we have to seek out physical movement not because we have to for the jobs we have to do but because we want to stay healthy and fit so you really see that uh, kicking in uh, around this time um it also gets a big boost in the in the 19th century um, because there is a, a, a naturalistic, uh, sorry, natu- nas- nationalistic uh, fever of it's it's important to to, to stay healthy and st- to stay fit, 
um, and to 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 perform your civic duties and to be a pr- a proud citizen, it becomes important to be to be healthy and fit. So we see that kind of like mental shift around this time, um, which hadn't really you know is ex- existed so much before. Um, then we see another uh, textbook come around in 1800, um, which is, and this this is really interesting to me. Um, it's it's the first uh, systematic textbook of gymnastics, um, and we're gonna we're gonna use this word gymnastics a lot um, and, and calisthenics as 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 we see the the fitness industry develop. Um, so in 1800 we see the first systematic systematic textbook on gymnastics, and in 1810 this guy Frederick John uh, becomes a pa- pioneer for physical education. Um, and basically starts to really develop um, bodies and minds through gymnastics and, and callis, calisthenics. So we really start to see this, all, all this stuff, to, uh, stuff start to develop that we still see today. The, the many of the techniques that start to you know develop around this time, you know, are still used today. Those basic gymnastic and calisthenic movements mm-hmm. start to develop around this time. Um, and I think it's not. You know, when it comes to gymnastics and calisthenics, it's never going. To, it's not going to be a million miles away from, you know, what the Romans and the Greeks were were doing. But it starts to become more of a defined thing. Uh, it starts to be obviously written down in a more structured way. It starts to be more of an organized thing, and starts to starts to be more of a, a taught thing uh, uh, to the masses. Um, you know, you see your, you, you see this, the first outdoor gym actually come up in 1811, uh, and, and it starts, uh, it starts to spread all, all through Europe from that, from that point. And again, most of these outdoor gyms are um, gymnastics and, and calisthenics. They're not, uh, they're not like outdoor gyms uh, right now, but you know, you, you, the popularity starts to rise. It starts to become a thing. You can kind of like parallel this at the same time uh, with what's going on in Scotland with the with the Highland Games which um, kind of goes back to like 18, the 1830s what's uh, the Highland Games so the Highland Games or I think over here you guys are called the Scottish Games so you're going to see um, you know events that have uh, caber tossing uh, hammer throwing uh, stone shot put running wrestling jumping um, more kind of these these explosive movements with weights um, with, with with heavier implements um, people would like. Uh, obviously, it was a huge display of masculinity, or, <laughs> or you know, um, to become the the kind of like uh, the warrior of the tribe kind of thing. Um, but again, it was it was a games. It was a sport. It was a you know similar to the to the Olympic games. It was the the kind of Scottish version of that. So you start to see the the real implementation of tools in physicality, uh, as opposed to it being just just in gymnastics and calisthenics, mm-hmm. so just about the body. The Highland Games starts to bring in the the, the use of objects heavy objects um, for the purpose of displaying strength and power um, also around the same time um, 1849 is the publication of survival of the fittest charles darwin's famous book ah. so in this book of course you know you're really um you're really emphasizing that those that are physically fit and healthy will survive the longest so that starts to enter people's consciousness so again it's no longer just about um, preparing for war or f- uh, gathering food or it's really thinking like if I want to live a longer life if I want to survive then it's important that I treat my body well and I, I um, you know I emphasize health and fitness as part of my as part of my routine um, and then in 1849 we also see the uh, the first athletic uh, competition which is conducted at the Royal Military Academy uh, in the UK um, Obviously, I, I, I mean, you could say the, the, the Olympics was the first CrossFit Games, or you could say that in 1839, 1849, the first athletic competition um, at the Royal Military Academy is the first CrossFit Games. So it was the first time kind of like in quote-unquote modern culture, you really see people competing against each other in an arena um, purely for thrills. You yeah. Know, you know. Um, and then in 1958... In, uh, at Oxford University in the UK, uh, you actually see the first well-equipped uh, gymnasium. Um, so I know a lot of people are thinking, so all this is going on in Europe, uh, what's going on in the US? It kind of happens a little bit later in the US, and there's a couple of pioneers involved, one of them which is, is a woman uh, uh, by the name of Catherine Beecher. 
um, and she was one of the first pioneers of fitness in the US and she actually opened a school in 1832, uh, a female school called the Hartford Female Seminary in 1823, uh, where fitness education uh, becomes part of the curriculum, uh, which was again unheard of at the time. So it becomes an important part of people's education, physical education. Um, then in uh, 1824, uh, this guy, Charles Beck, um, starts to open the first uh, outdoor gymnasium in Massachusetts. Um, and then it starts to spread across the U.S. Again, these are outdoor gyms, basically, that are just uh, gymnastics, bodyweight stuff, um, calisthenics. There's no real equipment yet. yet there's a bar going upright. There's a bar going right, sideways. Right. Yeah. It's basic stuff, but it's starting to catch on. It's starting to starting to spread. Um, and then this guy, Dudley Allen Sargent, um, he emerges as kind of the founder of physical education in the US. Um, and then from, um, from 1879 to 1919, um, he is uh, the director, sorry, 1879 to 1919, yeah, he's the director of uh, the gymnasium at Harvard University. Um, and you know, a lot of his work is based on the, the German and Swedish methods, um, uh, and it's encouraged for both men and women, but, you know, we're still talking, obviously, the natural method, we're still talking gymnastics and calisthenics, we're still, you know, we're still, you know, using our bodies, just our body weights to, to de develop, you know, physical strength and, and fitness and health uh, and that kind of stuff. It's not until a little later so with Charles Beck, he, interestingly, he starts to develop um, multiple uh, gymnastic apparatus. Like you were saying before, parallel bars, that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, up to this point, it's been mainly just bodyweight stuff. And now we start to see apparatus coming in. We start to see you know, machines, albeit very simple. We start to see basic machines uh, being introduced uh, to, to physical, um, to, these, to these physical gyms. Um, we start to see... Um, you know, more physical education coming about across the US at this point. And Beck warns, quote unquote, without solid physical education programs, people would become fat, deformed, and clumsy. I thought that was a great quote. Um, you know, you can, you could, it's very easy to fast forward that message and, uh, you know, reflect on some of the problems we, we have today um, because people, <laughs> don't take care of themselves in the way that they should. Um, but again, you know, everything we've talked about up to this point um, has been basically gymnast gymnastics and calisthenics. Um, and it was, it, it, was the, it was the use of these things to prepare us for, you know, originally to survive, originally to hunt, originally to gather, and then, then to prepare for battle. Uh, and then this consciousness about taking care of our bodies, bodies starts to kick in. And this kind of continues, continues, continues uh, until the, the 20th century when you really start to see the rise of the modern fitness industry as it, as it is today. Um, if, we go, if we look at uh, France at this time, uh, this guy Edmund, I can't really say the word, <laughs> Desbornay, I guess it's pronounced, Edward Desbornay. Checks he, out. Huh? Checks out. Yeah. He starts to basically open a chain of exercise clubs um, and also publications and fitness starts to become uh, an industry. He starts to, these, these, these gyms, obviously it starts small, it starts to pop up all over France. And you can see, you know, you can see how, you know, once it starts to catch on, it becomes, you know, it becomes popular, it becomes an industry, people start paying, um, albeit in the beginning, it was mainly reserved for the more wealthy, but it, over time, it, the, the cost became less, it starts to become more, um, more accessible to the masses. Uh, and he actually opened 200 fitness centers across the country. And uh, several early strongmen and bodybuilders uh, were proponents of his methods. So, you know, I think this can be seen really as the, the start of things um, across the globe in terms of like gyms and, and the where we are today. Um, in the USA, this guy, this guy Bernard uh, McFadden, he starts to starts the market uh, a wall mounted muscle developer uh, and founded uh, uh founded physical culture uh, in 1899 
Um, he staged the first physique contests in America in 1903, and then also in 1921 and 1922. And this guy, McFadden, basically introduces uh, Charles Atlas, which you may have heard of, uh, Charles Atlas, who becomes one of the one of the icons of fitness in the U.S., mm-hmm. um, he rises t- to to the scene uh, through uh, McFadden's uh, facilities and publications. Um, and by 1935, McFadden had 35 million readers. So this guy McFadden, by 1935, as I said, like at the beginning of the, of the century, you start to see gyms becoming more popular. And then by 1935, McFadden has 35 million readers of his publications all to do with fitness. So it really starts to, you know, yeah. catch on fire at that time. No knock to Americans, but I didn't know we had that many people who were literate. <laughs> Hey, it, even in 1935, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. So you have this period, um, I think, where you know fitness starts to take off, um, and you have, you know, there's a great book. Um, it's called uh, Dinosaur Training by by Brooks Kubrick, and it starts to talk about you know lifters in the I think he starts at like the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. And, you know, weights start to be introduced. You know, barbells start to be introduced. Um, you know, you see your, your classic strongman kind of competitions come about. Um, everything is, you know, at that, at that point still, there's no, there's no real machine. So if people are squatting, they're picking the barbell up off the floor, they're throwing it over their heads, onto their back, and then they're squatting from, from the ground. Um, it's still very primal. It's still very functional. It's still, you know, people having to, you know, shift a ton of weight around with their own bodies. Um, and then, you know, even, you know, up until the time of Schwarzenegger and, and kind of as, as he comes through in that generation, you know, of course, machines start to start to come into gyms. But there's still, you know, there's still a ton of barbell work, still a ton of dumbbell work. It's still those big primary movements that dominate the gyms. And gyms at that time are still are still very, um, what's the word, um, reserved for the few. It's not like gyms aren't like super popular at that point. Like bodybuilder almost, almost seen as like freaks or like circus <laughs> performers. Um, that 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 does change um and and one of the reasons why it changes in the 70s and 80s um is this guy arthur jones who who founds nautilus in 1970 and um nautilus basically develop a ton of machines there's a if you look at patents of arthur jones he has a ton of patents and all these machines that basically bring bodybuilding and resistance training to the masses via via these machines so it's no longer you know just barbells and dumbbells and stuff you see the 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 advent of all these different machines that you see today today in the gyms and he also nautilus goes on to make stuff like bowflex and stairmaster and all that stuff that you see on those infomercials in the 80s i was gonna ask if that's the infamous nautilus who's made all those products right yeah yeah so arthur jones invents nautilus nautilus goes into the, the gyms in the 70s and 80s you see this huge boom of fitness culture in the in, in, in the eighties, um, and you know it, it, at this point the genie's out of the bottle, and you know fitness becomes part of of, of modern culture in a commercial sense. Um, there's obviously a ton of money involved. Uh, Arthur Jones dies a very rich man, um, and you know gyms basically become a combination of Nautilus equipment, dumbbells, barbells, aerobics, you mm-hmm. know all that kind of stuff um, in the eighties. Um, and you know, you, you've seen that transition from the forties and fifties with like just barbells and dumbbells and strongman type training, uh, into the Schwarzenegger time, that generation who were basically combining that with the machines. And then you kind of enter this Nautilus age where, you know, and obviously other companies start to rise from that where gyms become dominantly machines. Um, people stop moving so much in terms of the way that the body would move naturally you know at this point as well i think it's fair to say that gymnastics and calisthenics have kind of taken a back seat to 
machines. They almost like disappear. Yeah, they almost like disappear during this time because, you know, it's easier and less quote unquote stressful and complicated to use a machine than it is to use our own bodies for some things. True. It's easier to do a lap pull down than it is to do a pull up. You know, so all these, you know, all these machines almost, although they come about by, by the, the want to, to improve people's fitness and introduce things that might help people get fit, but it kind of almost, not backfires, but it kind of almost takes people, people completely away from any kind of natural movement and, you know, machines start to really dominate the workout it starts to be very machine based and, and completely away from any kind of functional training um and i think you know that that pervades the 80s and the 90s um you, you don't really see you know olympic lifting is very much just for olympic lifters gymnastics is just for gymnasts um it's a very kind of like separated Carp- compartmentalized know, specific compartmentalized yeah. sport um, and that, that it stays that way basically until the early 2000s when, of course, you see the birth of, of CrossFit. Um, and when you see the birth of CrossFit, it's interesting, of course, Greg Glassman invents CrossFit and he is a gymnast. So you kind of see this, this hark back, this, this want to return to you know, everything that we've gotten away from. So we, if we go back to the beginning of the podcast when people were like, running and climbing and jumping and crawling and doing everything that was fundamental to, to our existence at that time, we now start to see um, uh, a revival of that situation. So when you, when you look at the, the, the birth of CrossFit, and if you, ever, uh, if you want a good read on this, there's a great book uh, called Learning to Breathe Fire. So JC Hertz, uh, writes, learning to breathe fire, uh, the rise of CrossFit and the primal future of fitness. Uh, and it's, it's a great book on, on, this, on this, this whole part of, uh, you know, of, ho- of ho- the whole part of our fitness uh, evolution. And, you know, it's really interesting because you see, you see the return of calisthenics, you see the return of gymnastics, you see the return of the barbell um, as our primary tools. Um, you see a rejection of machines. Um, you see the, the word functional training and the word function used time and time and time again, <laughs> and the word primal, you know, these words, paleo, primal, function, all these, all this stuff that again, harks back to the beginning of the seminar, they start to come back in. So it's almost, you can see that as a, almost a rejection of the, the kind of Arthur Jones movement of, of, um, you know, the, the Nautilus machines and, you know, everything that kind of stopped us moving naturally. Um, you saw that that kind of being rejected, and of course, CrossFit sees a, uh, of course, a huge popularity rise. You see boxes opening up all over the world. You know, it's it's like a, you know, for a while, it's 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 an unstoppable flame that just 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 burns everywhere, and uh, gets more and more popular, uh, and people get you know get more and more functional, and uh, you know, eventually it becomes you know a sport, uh, and then it becomes. A sport with paid athletes and then it kind of changes somewhat and becomes a different kind of thing um and then you know you have what crossfit is today um and then you kind of see interestingly and this kind of happened i think i think when i first really start to get involved um 2010 uh onwards uh, so crossfit basically starts in 2000 it's, it's super popular i mean still super popular now but like i, th- I think the glory is for like 2009 to like 2015 you see this kind of like embracing of, of crossfit culture and then at a certain point you start to think well this is this is great and this definitely serves a purpose but what about all that other stuff um surely that has some kind of purpose too so surely, surely that has some kind of use um so then you see this kind of like you know, whether you want to call it like functional bodybuilding or hybrid athletes or, you know, whatever you want to call it. You know, we, we, I remember we, we were joking at the, in the early days of Jim Jones, we would, we would use the term functionally jacked <laughs> because it was like, 
yeah, I, I, yeah, of course I want to be functional. I want to be able to move, but I kind of like the muscularity of, of the bodybuilding scene, uh, the aesthetic of the bodybuilding scene. Such a great term for it, functionally jacked. Yeah. I, I wanna, Spot on. I want the best of both worlds. So I think then you see the growth of, you know, the, these two things. You see the marriage of, of, of CrossFit and bodybuilding and strength training and strongman training. Um, people, it's, it's stupid to say, you know, one thing works and one thing doesn't. One thing has value and one thing doesn't. Because the truth is, they both have value, um, and if you if you if you if you drop your ego enough to just think, okay, what can I learn from this? How might this benefit me? Um, I think that there's so much that can be learned from both, you know, both sports, both CrossFit and bodybuilding, and and then I think you eventually, you know, you arrive in this wonderful hybrid space of of taking what works and and using it and kind of rejecting what doesn't, and of course that's different for different people. Um, but I think there's definitely, I mean, this is kind of why, you know, Faris exists because we, that's the kind of facility that, that we want to be. Uh, we want to be able to provide that space where, you know, we don't have any kind of dogma about the way we train. It's, it's simply, this will work for that. This will work for that. And we accept everything. And, um, under this roof, you will have access to, to, you know, whatever you want and need to have access to. Um, there is, there is a time and place for this and there is a time and place for that and everything has value. And if you put all that value together, you create a much better, much better product. Mm -hmm. So I think now as the fitness and, and industry stands, you see this kind of marriage of bodybuilding, CrossFit, strength training. Um, and uh, you know, even like, you know, I see a lot of hardcore CrossFitters like now, you know, doing a little bit more bodybuilding. And vice versa, like a lot of like hardcore bodybuilders using elements of CrossFit um, to to uh, for certain reasons. Um, you've seen a lot of obviously you know what we call bastardization of these things. So you've seen a lot of like studios cropping up that are stealing from this and stealing. Well, stealing is the wrong word, but let's say borrowing from this and borrowing adopting. from that, adopting, and it just becomes like a watered down mess version of not one, not the other, but just something. Um, and just kind of like, um, you know, doing it purely for financial reasons and it becoming somewhat of a physical mess. But, um, at the same time, if it's getting people moving, then of course there's, there's value in that. Um, but I definitely think like moving forward, you know, you, you see, you see, you see the marriage of all these different elements that we've, we've learned over time. And if you, if you, you know, again, go back to the, to the beginning of the podcast when we talked about you know the birth of of kind of fitness or you know in the beginning it was essential movement like what we had to do to survive and how we stayed fit in the beginning was through necessity like we had to we had to run we had to we had to hunt uh, we had to hunt we had to move to get our, our our sustenance we had to move to get away from the things that wanted to kill us um, and then we had to obviously move to, to farm and, and to, to gather our crops and to, to harvest. Um, and then uh, to, to go to war and to battle and to fight, we had to get fit. Um, and then, you know, like we talked about the, the advent of the, of the games and, and, this, and sport and, you know, the, the kind of awakening of like, oh my God, we can use this physicality for entertainment. And then, you know, the emphasis on, okay, actually, this kind of this stuff's kind of important for our health, mm -hmm. uh, especially as the industrial revolution comes around and we start to use machines more. Uh, we start to realize that we're going to have to find other ways to stay healthy. Um, and then, as we arrive at this place of you know gyms starting to open and you know it be becoming like a, a cultural thing and something that that fits into like our, our daily lifestyle, um, it helps us uh, move better. It helps us thrive better. It helps us with it helps us everything we do in the gym helps us with everything we do outside the gym, um, and whether you know whether it was you know the, the the original bodybuilding days or the Nautilus days or the CrossFit days or now the the hybrid days, we start to really see how important um, gyms have become to to our culture and to our to our days, um, and it's kind of a fascinating thing when you think about like the scale of it, like to think, you know, like I said, in the 1950s, you know, the gym was reserved for the very few. But these days, 
you know, there are more gym memberships than ever before. And gym, gym is a part of people's daily life. But it is, although there, there weren't gyms in the 1950s, what we have now is a culmination mm. of kind of everything that's happened before that's led us to this point. No, agreed. I mean, the barrier to entry always exists in terms yeah. of getting people in. It's usually been financial, but, you know, like you said, there's more people in the gym now, but not necessarily, there's still more people in general. So, you know, like you said, there's still more unhealthy people or people who don't, whether you want to call it meet the criteria of what we deem as healthy or, you know, for themselves at least too. Right. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting path to see that the ratio doesn't correlate to. Yeah, it is. It is interesting because we've gone from a place of obviously, everybody has to move all the time because you have to to survive to movement is a choice now you know you don't have to move if you don't want to you can stay on your couch all day and watch tv if you want to like movement is no longer a necessity we have to make it happen um so again this is why gyms are are more important than ever or you know some people don't go to the gym people some people have outdoor pursuits and they they get fit that way but no i think for the reality is for most people that live in you know cities and, and towns and, and so forth gyms gyms are going to be you know an essential part of what we do essentially part of our days moving forward because we no longer move like we used to we no longer have to well, i think um, there's more of not just a personal responsibility but a social one because right we if you want to live with this many people like taking care of people's health like you know we saw the pandemic like we're gonna have this many people who we have to say, hey, we gotta shut businesses down, shut these things down to protect the health and well-being of X amount of our population because they are at risk. We need to make sure that we are safer as a country. Right. You know, I'm gonna say national security or just our economy itself is determined on you know just the social, not even your own personal responsibility, but your choice. You know, yes. has ripples and effects on people around you. Yeah, and also, also, you know, because it's been you know talked about a lot lately that the pressure on. Uh, the pressure on, um, you know, doctors and hospitals and nurses and, you know, we put them under pressure when we don't take care of ourselves. Yeah. So it's not just about, you know, you taking care of yourself for yourself. It's like you say, it's, it's you taking care of yourself for, for, for others, for those around you, for to not overwhelm the, the medical profession. Um, you know, there's obviously in the UK, we have the NHS and there's you know, a lot of stuff of, you know, don't overwhelm the NHS and a lot of that, falls on us to take care of ourselves um and, and there is I, I i do i do see a general lack of, of responsibility when it when it comes to that that mm-hmm. kind of thing it's like you know i expect others to take care of me and that that shouldn't be the case like of course at some point in our lives like people may need to take care of us for one reason or another but it shouldn't be expected that i don't have to take care of myself because there are people who are paid to take care of me for me yeah <laughs> like a, i think there's a, a weird... there's a massive miscommunication with that because i think that you know our politicians and just our healthcare systems themselves don't aren't there for our best interests like if you still got hurt you're gonna do an accident doing something it's still gonna cost you an arm and a leg to get things fixed surgery this is not i mean yeah you pay a certain premium but it doesn't cover you it doesn't yeah. favor you to say hey p you did took care of your health here you didn't go to the hospital at all you had no accidents like there's your money back. There's no in, like proper incentivization for yeah. our culture, of, especially we're a, you know, a uh, what's it called capitalist society, but we don't favor people or stigmatize or incentivize people to to be healthier, right? And do those things almost like, the reverse. We get we get mad at politicians because <laughs> it's like, wait, you're not telling us not to eat certain products because that company gives you a certain amount of money, or this yeah. insurance company doesn't want you doesn't give you an incentive as a politician for this area community to have more healthier people doing yeah. X, Y, Z. So again, money and politics, Yeah, it, yeah. It, it hurts us all. So to summarize guys, in the beginning we moved a lot. <laughs> then we didn't move at all. Well, then we, then we, then we, then we, in the beginning we didn't move at all. No, in the beginning we did move all the time. We had to. We had to. Had to. And then at some point in time, movement became a choice, but most people still moved. And then we got to the point where the majority of people didn't move because they didn't have to. And now at the point where we hope that people will start to use the services that we provide (laughs) to start moving again. That's a friendly way to put it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, 
you know, it's just so important to, to, to human nature. You know, we weren't, you know, we weren't born, we weren't created. We weren't, our bodies aren't made to sit in offices all day, nine to five. They're not, they're not, they're not made to be sedentary. They're made to move. They're made to, they're made to be in action. They're made to be in motion. They're, they're made to, you know, do cool shit. Um, and, you know, I know, I know a lot of you, a lot of, a lot of people listen to this. I'm preaching to the converted, but I think often we do forget that it's a, a relatively small percentage of the population that make physicality a part of their day and an essential part of their day. So we need to spread the word. We need to get more people moving, uh, you know, and fitness and physical culture needs to be a part of everybody's daily life, not just, not just for the few, um, not just for those that can afford gym memberships, but it needs to be a, a consciousness and it's all that, that the human body needs physical activity. You've said it. Consciousness. That's it. That's it's it. got to be conscious. The people got to be aware. And we got it. <laughs> All right, you guys. That's it for today. Uh, I hope you found at least some of that uh, interesting. Um, and me and Brandon will be back with you shortly. Stay, for safe, uh, stay safe out there. And um, we'll see you real soon. Cheers. Cheers.